Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pasco Laboratories. I'm Dr. JP, and a lot of people ask me, what does the P stand for? Well, oddly enough, the P stands for problem solver, which is exactly what I'd like to do with you today. I'd like to solve a problem with you. If you'll join me as we take a look at this age-old problem right out of the textbook, join along with me, shall you? Train A heads north at an average speed of 95 miles per hour, leaving its station at the precise moment as another train, Train B departs a different station heading south at an average speed of 110 miles per hour. If these trains are inadvertently placed on the same track and start exactly 1,300 miles apart, how long until they collide? Well, that's really a great question. In fact, we've been asking this same question to our students for the past 100 years. And the reality behind this question is that our students might not have any experience about trains whatsoever. Truth is, the last time our experience 
right? The last time our students experienced trains was maybe virtually, which is why the answer our students come back with is, who rides a train when you can Zoom? It's actually the correct answer nowadays. The fact is that your students probably only saw a train when they watched the Polar Express, which really makes me question the relevance behind this question. We might as well be asking our students about a transatlantic crossing. And of course, we all know how that's going to end. Think about our students today. They're more common, they have come in contact more often with self-driving cars than they have with trains. And so we ask ourselves this question, and it's a good question. Might it be time to update the approach we use when talking about trains or motion? And the answer is probably yes. But don't panic because we have an answer for you. We have Mr. Dan Burns, who is an expert in travel and an expert in physics. And he's ready to show us how we can take this age old problem of trains colliding and turning it into some new age phenomena that uses computer science, graphing and motion to help us understand the entire process. We're ready to see it. Dan, take it away. Thanks, JP. And you're right, those train problems have been around a long time and they're difficult. And to get your students ready to solve problems like that, you're gonna have to have them do some activities so they can learn how to describe the motion of objects. And what I'm excited about is the smart cart motor lets them control motion. You can really understand motion when you can control it. One of the more popular activities to get students to apply what they've learned about motion is match graphing. You give them different uh, graphs, position time, velocity time, and then they try and match it with some object moving or maybe themselves. Well, with the smart cart motor, we can take that to another level. So I have the um, prediction for a graph. You could give this to your students or maybe they make their own predictions. This is a position time graph on the screen here. And what they need to do is tell the smart cart motor to move the smart cart to match this graph. This is an activity that's in the PASCO experiment library that you could download right now. And you also get the capstone or SparkView files that have the code. And so the students tell the cart how fast to go and at what time. This is a more advanced one in the activity. So in here, you can see that it's gonna start moving at time zero up to time two at a speed of 10. Well, that's not meters per second. That's just the power level of the smart cart motor. It can go anywhere from negative 100 up to 100, and 100 corresponds to about a half meter per second. The students can figure out what that is if you want, or you can just have them match the shape of the graph. That's the idea. So what I've done is looked at the graph and figured out what to do here, and then the moment of truth comes, I need to check it out. So I hit record. I wanted to show you how to do this uh, prediction. So you just click this and you can click and it draws your prediction like that. Get rid of that. So that's how I made the, the red prediction. Pretty easy for students to do. So here we go. Let's see if it matches it. Ooh, that's the best one yet. Let's stop. Now it should go faster. Oh, uh, well. I'll take that, and I also predicted using the numbers, uh, meters per second and stuff, where it was going to end up and came within a few centimeters. So once they've done activities like this, maybe now they're ready for the train problem. So what we're going to do is put the blue cart over here at this end of the track, and we can control two smart carts with motors as well. So the red one is here. And let's go over, so uh, the P is for problem solving. And so this is a problem to solve. So this is uh, how uh, students might go through this problem. First, a diagram of what the situation is, and then try and assign a coordinate system. So I picked uh, the front of the red card as my origin, and to your right is positive and the blue card is 1.8 meters from that. My job is to predict 
when are they going to meet? They're going to go toward each other at two different speeds. And where are they going to meet? Where should I put this? So to solve that, I figure out what I'm given. I'm given where uh, I'm given the initial speed of the red cart, so 0.12. So again, your students could figure that out by just having the red cart go at a power level of 20 and then get the slope of that line and they'd know the speed. And then it starts at zero. And then the blue cart has an initial position of 1.8 and its power setting is 30. And that corresponds in this case to negative 0.18. Why the negative? Well, I made a coordinate system and it's going to the left. Now you can also do this with relative velocity. I prefer to do, to do it this way because when you get into more complex problems, this way is the way to go. So I have equations of motion for each cart that's gonna tell me where they are at any time in the future. There's no acceleration other than the very initial part when they turn on. So I can simplify the equations if I like. And I can write the equation for the red cart, putting in my values and the equation for the blue cart. Now this is one reason these are tough problems. There's two unknowns, but I do know that when they meet, the positions are the same. So my question is at what time is X red equal to X blue? So I just set those two as equal to each other and I get 0.3 e equals 1.8 and I get six seconds. So they're gonna meet at six seconds, but where is that gonna be? How do I get that? I just put it back into my original equations and I find out it's, it's 0.72 meters. So that would correspond to meeting about here. Now you might say, why did I do it in both equations? I only needed to do it in one. Well, you can check your work in these. They're tough problems, but I know if I did it right, if I get the same answer for both of those. So let's see if it works. So I'm gonna need to open up another file. And I wanna make sure that the carts are connected. Now I have a position time graph up here in the top. The red and the blue position will both show up there. Down below I put a force graph. And so I wanna first make sure I zero the force sensors. And I'll tell you why I have that. So each one has a little bumper on it. And so when they meet, the force sensor is gonna uh, go from zero up to some value and it's gonna tell them to stop. So we won't have any massive carnage when they crash into each other. Uh, they'll, they'll put the brakes on them. So here we go. I put a two second delay in. Oh no, they're gonna crash. Pretty good. So they stopped, oh, maybe 0.7 centimeters away from where I predicted, that's pretty good. Also notice the force reading, even though the blue cart was going faster, the force that each cart experienced was the same. So you can even get them starting to think about forces while they're learning their kinematics. Now, this isn't how trains should behave. If they find out they're on the same track heading toward each other, at least one of them should break, right? And so I'm not gonna go through the solution to this one. This is a more advanced problem. But what we're gonna do is have them on the same track going toward each other And this one's gonna put the brakes on. In other words, I'm gonna give it a constant negative acceleration. And I did go through and solve this and I found out that they're gonna make their closest approach here. I solved it so they all, maybe they'll touch or get really close to it. So that's a different file. And make sure it connects. So here you can see the position at the top and then velocity graph on the bottom. And 
there's a short piece of code there that turns the power setting into real meters per second, meters per second squared, and so on. And it's telling this cart to have an initial velocity and an initial negative acceleration, and that one just have an initial negative velocity. So here we go. Oh, they're gonna hit, they're gonna hit. Oh, missed it by that much. So it came pretty close to that. Uh, so you can do, you can imagine all the different things you can do. Just having this one do constant acceleration uh, motion by itself without the extra uh, train there is, I, I would have loved to have that in my classroom. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to have it in yours. Another thing I always wanted in my classroom was jerk. Not the Caribbean chicken dish, not somebody that doesn't know how to act with others, but a rate of change of acceleration. In this case, a constant rate of change of acceleration, so constant jerk. So what we can do is program that into Blockly as well. And I'm just gonna demo that really fast here. And so we have the blue cart time graph at the top, a velocity graph in the middle, and an acceleration graph in the bottom. And I also calculated that it should reach about here. And then it's going to hit the brakes, which you could also try and calculate as well. So here we go, constant jerk. So it went a little past because it breaks there. So you can see you get actually a cubic for the position graph, a parabola for the velocity graph, and pretty close to a straight line here for the acceleration graph and the slope of that would be the jerk and that's in the program. The code is very similar to what we just saw, except it's a, a little more complex, so this is more advanced. Now I showed you using the force sensor built into this, we're also using the position sensor to control the smart cart motor, but any PASCO sensor can be used to do that. And so if you have other PASCO sensors, your students can come up with all kinds of things to do a sense and control experiment. One of the ones I came up with was to uh, have one of the cards play the red light, green light game. So I mounted a wireless light sensor to a smart cart with a motor, and I have our wireless light source changing colors randomly, red, uh, stop, right, green, go, yellow, go really fast. No, yellow goes slower. And you know the, the playground game where you get closer and closer to the person that's it, and if they see you move when they say red light, then you're, you have to start over again. Well, the smart cart motor always wins. And I think we have a video of us doing that because the lights are too bright in here, but it does work in a fairly well-lit office, as you'll see. Let me cue that up. Well, it looks like it's time for us to update the way we've been doing our labs, especially when it comes to thinking about computational thinking, smart driving cars, and the way that our students experience the world around them nowadays. So whether you're in Norway or Riyadh, and thank you both for joining us today, or right here in the United States, we're always looking for ways to bring new ideas, a new wave of thinking to your students. And we really do believe that tying computational thinking and our smart card and wrapping it all around Blockly makes this more relevant. It becomes more of a question of self-driving cars than of two trains colliding. And that's exactly where our students are thinking. So let's help them think. 
Let's help them problem solve. And that's why the P this week stood for problem solving, and we're really glad you joined us for solving this problem. As always here at Pasco Laboratories, we wish you the best of luck, great teaching, and good day.